But what I'm saying is, I never read that before he had a teaching, like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, like his uh, first sermon there when he spoke to them in Nazareth. He took the book and he found the place where it was written and so forth. The scriptures never tell us that there was any singing going on in there. I'm sure there was probably singing going on after a lot of people got healed. But I never read about a praise and worship service. Am, am I making sense? I'm not putting it down. Thank God we have the privilege. But j just think about it sometimes. But again, we, we'd like you to, uh, those that can, watch us on Facebook. And um, you can, uh, if you miss us tonight, you can uh, uh, get it on Facebook later when it's, when it's archived on Beechard Moorfield or Eagle's Nest Forum. And uh, once again, log on to that and get get into that. Also, you can watch us on Facebook, not Facebook, on YouTube. Thank you. And um, we, I encourage you to find us on YouTube channel, Beechard Moorfield, or, or for um, Faith, uh, Speak Faith TV. You can also find us there. And uh, uh, when you do, uh, subscribe. Hit a like button or do something. Let us know you're watching. Um, three books, Covenant of Health. Uh, 172 pages of healing and the ability to stay well. You know, sickness and disease will come. Symptoms will come. But when they come, we have the option and we can fight and overcome them. And that's exactly what we should do. Covenant of Health. This book is $15. If you'd like to have it, uh, contact me on uh, at my uh, email, morefieldbeecher at gmail.com. A second book that I wrote, The Greatness Beneath My Feet. This is about 21 different testimonies of people who loaned me their shoulders to stand on so that I can do what God has called me to do without any restrictions. And again, I'm thankful to God for every one of them. Some of you watching are in this book. Uh, there, a lot of the people that, that are in this book are still alive today. There's a few that have gone home to be with the Lord. My mom and my dad, our, my first pastor and his wife, um, and, and, and others. It, it's, still, it's, a, it's a good place to be when you're able to stand on the shoulders of people who love God and they want to see the kingdom go farther than they could reach. It's not a matter of self. It's a matter of promoting the things of God. And that book also is $15. The third book I want to share with you, my newest book, Covenant of Wealth, 197 pages of God's financial plan. And God does have one. He said in his word, 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest what? Prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Well, what, what brings about soul prosperity? The word. It's called the renewing of the mind. And oftentimes it is the word that is preached to us. The message that is delivered, testimony of the truth of God's word that is delivered that will speak to our hearts and speak to our minds that help us to attain to that. You know, Jesus said everybody that's been born again has been born again because of either his words directly or the words of the disciples or people who believed on him through their word. Well, you know, I never saw Jesus when I was growing up. He had already gone to be on the right hand of the Father. But I tell you what I did here, I heard about a lot about what Jesus said and what those disciples wrote down through other men and women of God of this hour. So once again, we offer you the, these three books, fifteen dollars a piece. And if you'd like to buy all three, uh, the the price is thirty five dollars for all three, and there will be some shipping and handling. Now, each book ship if single book four dollars, uh, we found is is the price for that. And if you want to buy all the books, shipping and handling would be 10. So that's a pretty good discount. That's about a buck 20 discount for each of the, of the books. Let's get into the Word, shall we? Oh, one more thing. Uh, 
If you do not have a home church, and uh, I want to invite you to join me at King Christian Center in uh, King, 995 Brown Road in King, North Carolina, on Friday, June the 16th at 7 p.m., Saturday, June the 17th at 10 a.m., and then Sunday, June the 18th at 10 a.m. Uh, for three days of ministry. Two of those days will be devoted to leadership, Friday and Saturday, and then Sunday I'll be speaking on Father's Day Sunday. We're looking forward to a great time in the Word. All right, have you got your Bibles? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 995 Brown Road is the address. Yes, sir. Fasting. What happens when you fast? You fast to supercharge your spirit. Does fasting move God? What moves God? Faith. And how's faith come? Hearing. Hearing. Yes, indeed. Ongoing, the Word of God. All right. Does faith come by praying? No, it doesn't. Can you build yourself up in, in or on your faith by praying? Yes, you can, but you're not going to build your faith up. I've shared with you before, I'm convinced that our biggest problem in the church today where that issue is concerned is not a lack of faith. It's a lack of spiritual strength within ourselves to stand on our faith when the trial, the test, or the temptation comes against us. We need to learn to stand, folks. Having done all to stand, what are you supposed to do? You know, it didn't say having done all to stand, stand as long as you feel like it. It said having done all to stand, and then the next question is, how long are you going to stand? Forever. Forever. You know, it's not just enough to stand till you get it. If you just stand till you get it and you quit standing, it'll be stolen from you. When the word is sown, what happens immediately? Satan comes to steal the word. That's, um, well, he just comes to steal the word. Uh, in, in talking about prosperity, the Lord spoke to me the other day and said, if you, listen closely, and you can, if you become financially well off on your dime, it's also easily lost. No matter how hard you work, it's too easily lost. And then you have to do it all over again. That's not easy. That's devastating. But when you get rich on God's dime, that means you got rich his way. And when you do that God's way, he's got skin in the game, shall we say. And he has made a way for you to keep that which he has given to you. And even if the enemy can succeed in stealing it, God will restore it. Isn't that good news? Amen. So we know what fasting does. Fasting allows you to supercharge your spirit. What's the first thing Jesus did after he was filled with the Spirit in the, at the Jordan at his baptism? Went into the wilderness. And what did he do in the wilderness? He fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Then he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Okay? Again, the reason for fasting is you supercharge your spirit because, listen, I, I, I wish people would learn this. How many places have you been in churches where people are praying for a move of the Spirit? Okay, question. Uh, what caused the move of the Spirit in Genesis 1-3? God spoke. Whatever God said, Holy Spirit immediately moved to bring it to pass. Okay, what caused the first move of the Spirit in your life? You, you had to speak. 
You spoke. What did you say? What God said, the word. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That brings about a moving of Holy Ghost. And what did he do when you said that and did that? When you said you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead. What happened then? Holy Ghost moved, what, but what did he do? He brought about the new birth, right? Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If ye therefore being evil, that is natural people, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? So what happens when as a Christian you ask the Father for the Holy Ghost? What happens when you ask in faith? You receive. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, what happens? Physical evidence, the first evidence is your faith, but you will speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. Uh, why is it somebody, and, and sadly, I, I wish this were always the case, but it's not. I know people who have been born again and filled with the Spirit for many years, and they still seem to have difficulty speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. And, and the reason is, Part of it is because perhaps they've not been taught the truth about being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. They think that the Holy Ghost is going to take charge and force it out of you. Never has. He's not going to start now. And then, then there are those who think that, uh, uh, that to be filled with the Spirit, that it's just, they don't understand the difference in the gift of being filled with the Spirit and the tongues that come subsequent to that and the tongues that come with the gift of diverse kinds of tongues, which is one of the gifts of the Spirit. These are things that, for whatever reason, in many churches, even though there might be Pentecostal, they're not taught. They're not taught. And if they're not taught, people can't believe. And if they're not taught and people can't believe, then there, there's no faith to be exercised in that. And where you have no faith to exercise, you are spiritually weak, perhaps even completely bereft of the ability to move into the things of God. Jude verse 20, but you, beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. You see, when, when Romans 8, likewise the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. When we know not what we should pray for as we, as we ought, the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What, what, what's he doing when he's helping? What's he helping? Our infirmities. What's an infirmity? It's a place of weakness. It's a place where we cannot Listen closely, an infirmity in the life of believer is a place where the believer cannot function at the level God desires. You got that? What happens if you've got a football team and they have great players everywhere except right guard? It's an infirmity. And what's going to happen at that position? A team that knows how to handle that is going to capitalize on that right guard position and they're coming through on that guy every chance they get. Every chance. What happens in a basketball team if you've got a, uh, if you've got a floor general? He, he's supposed to be the, what do you call it, the shooting forward? Point guard, okay. Oh, yeah, point guard. The forward, the point guard, help me, because I'm not a basketball player, you know, don't know the terminologies. But what happens if you got a point guard who's the weakest player on the team? He ain't on the floor. Yeah, he won't be on the floor very long because the opposing team will capitalize on that. What happens if you have a center in basketball that can't rebound? That weakness is going to, yeah, the coach is going to see to it he's not even left on the floor. 
So think about what I'm saying. God does not want to dispose of his people. God does not want to bench his people. But how many of God's people are benched today because they're not practicing with the team? How many people, how many of God's people are benched today because they have not taken the time to strengthen themselves and make sure that the position they fill is filled with proper strength? That means you're going to be benched. That's just the way it works. All right? It's not God's fault, folks. It's ours. It's ours. Oh, well, a guy who throws the shot put, and he doesn't throw it, they put it, who puts the shot put in the Olympics, do you think he's going to lift any weights? Why? To build strength in their arm because that shot, that shot put weighs 16 pounds and they can't throw it. They hold it and they push it. Now there's, a, there's movement of the body but they're in a limited circle of, of movement and before they leave that circle they've got to put that shot and then remain in the circle. The discus thrower the same way. The javelin thrower. The hammer throw. Do you suppose that, I, I don't know all the people who run today, but uh, the, uh, is Hussein Bolt retired now? Yeah. But when he was at the height of his game, wasn't anybody who could catch him. You don't think he did that once and then from then on out just came out on race day, do you? Of course not. He practiced. He kept his strength strong. Did you know the Bible tells us that we are to fortify our strong places? Okay. Was Jesus tempted? Was Jesus weak when he was tempted? Um, spiritually? No. Physically, he was hungry. Physically, he was weak. But spiritually, he's at the peak of his game. Jesus stayed at the peak of his game. He did what was necessary. Do you suppose Jesus kept the word? This might seem kind of like a elementary class, but th this is a kind of a review we need to give ourselves once in a while. We need to take ourselves through this. Does the word say this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1.8. Do you believe Jesus did that? Yeah, he was a doer of the word. Lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Did Jesus do that? And what happened when he laid his hands on them? They recovered. You see, Jesus stayed at the peak of his game. Listen closely. God will always confirm his word with signs following, but the word that is followed, his word, upholds his word, must come from a vessel that is at the upper echelon of the game, not weak, spiritually, spiritually emaciated and broken down. God, <laughs> life and death Actually, it says, death and life are in the power of the, does that include you? Sure does. Sure does. Didn't, does the word say uh, that if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? Why was Jesus so free? Because the truth made him that way. Now, yes, he was the word made flesh, but Jesus, he had the capacity within him to speak something other than the word. He was tempted in all points like as we are. A temptation is not a true temptation unless it is possible that the person who is being tempted would fall prey to it. If it was impossible for Jesus to fall prey to temptation, then Jesus was never truly tempted. But Jesus was tempted. Think about it. But he never fell prey to it. 
because he was always operating at the top of his game. Let me take a moment tonight and ask you to consider that. Where are we in our game? I, I was talking with, with a couple of brothers today, and uh, one of them is just, it, it, both, both of these good men, men of God, and, and one of them in particular, I think both of them do, but one was talking about how he loves to study not only the Scriptures, but he loved to, he likes to read and study about how the Jew, the Israelite before the Jew, how they operated in the Scriptures, what it meant to them. What did Passover mean to them? Because if you were born as an Israelite and raised up in that family, or in the days after Israel had been lost and, and they became the Jews, they were in the country, late nation of Judah. If you were born in those days, Passover meant something to you. That bread and that cup meant something to you, very special. But how many Christians today have an inkling of what the cup and the bread really means? Most, again, sadly, I don't believe that the majority of Christians understand the depth of, of the, uh, have a deep understanding of the bread and the cup. I just don't believe it happens. That, that's sad. I, I, we need to study the scriptures. But Jesus understood these things and kept himself at the peak of his game. I've had people say to me from sometimes, uh, you, read, you read too much stuff that's not, about, not in the Bible. Well, yeah, maybe I do read a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. But when I read it, I'm doing it to gain insight into what certain things were in the Bible. I'm reading it to gain insight from other godly men, if, if at all possible, about the things that I can use in my ministry to be a better minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people around me. We need to... Ministers who are stagnant are taking people down. Sir, if, madam, if you're in the fivefold ministry, you need to be growing every day. I'll just put it this way. If, if you can't grow or won't grow in ministry, it's time to get out of the ministry and just quit. And get out of the way because you're bringing people down. But if you are growing and you are moving forward, it's time for you to improve even beyond that, to grow more. I don't care how much you've grown, you grow more. What, when, when Paul was, was imprisoned, did he not write and ask that the scrolls of certain biblical authors be brought to him? Why? Because he understood the necessity to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All of these things I'm talking about are the things that Jesus did in order to remain at the top of his game. Now the question is now, do we want to be at the top of our game? You know, I'm, I'm trying to be kind here, but I, I need to ask the question personally, do you want to be at the top of your game? Okay, in my discussion with with uh, the the two fellows today, this this point came up. The uh, one of them made the statement. He said, "You know, the the Bible does not say that the law has been destroyed. In fact, Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it.' And so we begin to talk about some of the things that fulfilled the law. And I asked him, uh, I asked him, but well, what kind of animal?" land animal, would be clean according to the law for you and I to eat. There were two qualifications. It had to chew the cud, and it had to have a cloven hoof. Any animal that chewed the cud and had a cloven hoof was fit or considered kosher for consumption by the Israelite or the Jew. Are, we, are, are we, you with it? Okay. Jesus said, I have not, and that's in the law. That's in the Old Testament. Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to 
fulfill it. Now, I'm, I'm gonna, when you hear what I'm about to say, you'll get the connection about what this has to do with anointing. How does that apply in today's world to the church? Cloven hoof, could. That's the could in the mouth. How about the cloven hoof? And how do you walk? Godly. Your foot with God's foot. Cloven hoof. Okay? Now let me ask this. Let me, now let me ask this question. And please, if you're, if you're watching on Facebook, don't get angry with me, please. And I beg you folks here tonight, don't get angry with me. In how many churches today are people hearing a minister of the gospel, somebody from the fivefold ministry? Let's just talk about this past Sunday. How many messages from the pulpit this past Sunday were less than the Word of God? How many ministers stood in the pulpit this past Sunday with less than the Word of God coming out of their mouth? You suppose that was possible? Preaching social reform, preaching politics, preaching fear, tradition, doubt, unbelief. That, that's, not, that's not godly. That person is not chewing the could. Now, how, how long does the cow chew the cud? Let's say a cow lives to be 14 years old. How long does she chew the cud? 14 years. Once she's weaned off the, off the udder and begins to eat grass, a cud is developed. And that cud is chewed Day and night, night and day. And if a, and a cow can lose the cud, and if they do, they need some type of help getting it back. Because you, you know what the cud is? It's regurgitated grass or feed. A cow eats grass or oats or grain or whatever it's fed, chews it, it's mixed with saliva, it's swallowed. That saliva, that food that's been used now mixes with certain stomach digestive enzymes and is regurgitated, and the cow chews it again. It's done like that until it has gone through the four compartments of the cow's stomach, and finally, if this is a milk-producing cow, she will, by that process, produce milk. We got that? Okay. So, how does the believer lose the could? They stop eating the word. They stop eating the word. And so how many, I, I, again, I'm not saying this to be ugly to anybody. I just want you to think with me. How many ministers and how many pulpits in America and around the world this past Sunday did not, did not step into the pulpit with a could in their mouth? Too many. One would be too many. Okay? Question. The other side of the same coin. How many ministers stood in the pulpit this past Sunday and delivered, quote, a sermon, end quote, to the congregation who themselves are not walking a godly life? What's wrong with their foot? It's not cloven. It's padded. It's padded. Now my question to you is this. In the Old Testament, for an animal's meat to be clean, what was required? That animal had to chew the cud and have a cloven hoof. Else it was unclean. What about the messages? coming out of the mouths of ministers this coming Sunday morning that are not in alignment with the Word of God. It is unclean. 
What about ministers who walk into the pulpit this coming Sunday morning who are deliberately and knowingly in their own heart not walking according to the Word of God? It is unclean, right? So my, my question then comes to the believer, to the person who attends the church. Is the person that is feeding you the Word of God, are they clean or unclean in the eyes of God? Just a thought. Just a thought. That's why the Bible says, know them that labor among you. You need to know not only what's in their mouth, but how they're walking. Let me put it to you another way. We have ministers who are talking the talk, but not walking the walk. We have many, yeah, they can preach a good message faith-wise, but Monday through Saturday, only God knows what they're up to. And then we have other ministers who are walking the walk. You can't fault their day-to-day -day life. But coming out of their mouth is tradition, doubt, fear, and unbelief. Once again, this is not an attack on ministers. It is simply the fact that we, the church, need to wake up. We need to come alive as to what is being put into our ears because that's how our faith comes. Let's go a little further. Let's talk about fish. In the Old Testament, there were certain kinds of fish or water creatures that you could not eat. And there was one kind that you could eat. What was what had to be the case for fish that was edible under the Old Testament? It had to have scales. It had to have scales. What are scales a type and a shadow of? The armor of God. You could eat Bass, perch, bluegill, whiting. Flounder has scales. Yeah. The best of my knowledge, it does. Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe. I, yeah, I think you're right, sir. I don't think it does. But if, if it did not have scales, it was unclean. Let's bring that into the New Testament. Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to what? Fulfill it. That does not mean that today in this day, this time of our life that we can't eat shrimp, that we can't eat clams, that we can't eat oysters, that we can't eat fish. You can't eat shark or catfish. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a good shark steak is hard to beat. Catfish is some fine stuff when it's been, you know, cleaned well and, and salt, you know, cornmeal and, and oh, just... You eat till you swell up. You just eat it all day long. It's good. It's tasty. Jesus, the Word, is not telling us that we can't eat that today, but what it's saying to us is that what comes into our spiritual man needs to come from a source that has scales or a man or woman of God that is wearing the whole armor of God. Yeah. See, the Word has not been... The, the law has not been destroyed. It has been fulfilled. Go back to the cloven hoof and the, and the uh, uh, cud in the mouth. You know, I'm not averse to a good piece of bacon or pork chop. In fact, I had today for, for lunch, I had spaghetti carbonara. Mmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that mean, that's an Italian name. Spaghetti is Italian dish. Carbonara is the way they say uh, pork or bacon. You, you know, it, it's because it has to be cooked until it's done. It was called carbonara. That's, that's where that name comes from. Are you with me? Now, I can enjoy bacon today. And there's nothing sinful about it. Why? Because in the New Testament, in the physical side of the foods, remember the story about Peter on Cornelius' rooftop? And, a, and he had a vision, and in the vision, a sheet was let down from, the, from, the, from heaven, and inside that sheet was all manner of four-footed beast, four beasts. 
And the Lord told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. What did Peter say? No, no unsanctified things ever cross these holy lips. Um, yeah. And what did God say? Don't you call unclean what I've cleansed. Clean. And what, what, what does God call it when I have the food sitting before me and I say, Father, I receive this food as sanctified. How? By the word and prayer. That means it is now clean. Hallelujah to the Lamb. That means I can enjoy my pork chops. I can enjoy my catfish. I can enjoy clam strips, shrimp, fried shrimp. Glory to God. I can enjoy. I can, oh, it, it, isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome? I can, enjoy, I can go down to the coast and enjoy a shark steak. When you take a good size shark steak, that thing will be that, you know, almost the size of a basketball. It'll cover a plate up. It'll be an inch, inch and a half, two inches thick. It is delicious. And it's pure protein. Nothing wrong with that. But remember, the law has been fulfilled. Are we still together? Okay. Are you signaling me, my dear? Okay. My, my point is this. Do we want our anointing to be operating at its highest level? 1 John 2 tells us that the anointing does something for us. What does it do? It teaches us. Are you living a life that allows the Spirit of God to reside in and upon you and utilize the anointing to teach you what you need to know about ministry. Um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to be self-aggrandizing, arrogant, but I talk to ministers sometimes I remember years ago, there was a young man that would come to my house. I had a gym in my basement, and I would work out, and, and I'm, I was certified physical trainer, so I'd work out, and I'd work with these guys, some of them, and they'd come in every week. And young ministers would come, and before the training session was over, we'd always end up talking about the scriptures. And he was always asking me, where'd you get this or that? Or that? Because we were talking about some good stuff. And I'd say, it's in the Bible. Oh, where did you get so it's in the Bible? Where? And I could tell them, and sometimes they'd, they'd, they'd run to the car, get their Bible, come back, and we just have a Bible study right there. And they would open the Bible up and read, I don't see that. Well, what's going on? I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be ugly about anybody, but the problem was they were not living in with the manifest presence of Holy Ghost in and upon them in such a way that the Holy Spirit and the anointing in them could communicate to them what they needed to know. And so everything they ever preached is what somebody else had preached to them. Everything they ever said is what uncle or daddy or grandpa or their favorite pastor said to them. How long does it take before something that a man says begins to be polluted? Have you ever played the game in, in a room, maybe you had 12 people or more, and, and you, the, the host would go over and maybe write down a message or something on a piece of paper and give it to, the, to that person and they read it, a very short statement. You know, not something that everybody in the room already knows, like Mary had a little lamb, but write down a short statement, you know, like, my hair is orange, my eyes are blue, you know, we're in this room and I see you, something similar, like, you know, some dumb little thing, and then, and say, tell that person, now you read that, then now you whisper it in the ear of, every, of the next person and so forth and so on. What happens by the time it gets to the last person? It's changed. It's changed. Did you know that happens to preachers? 
Do you know there's a Bible there's a Bible example of that? When Paul was in Ephesus, let's uh, let's see if we can find that. Uh, I can tell you it's recorded in the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. If one of you Bible scholars, uh, uh, where Paul came to the disciples and uh, uh, asked uh, how many of them had been baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they said, we haven't so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. That's in the, that's in the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. 19, 4, 17. Yep, there it is. See, you said it, not there it was in the Bible. I ain't turned the page. I had, it, I had it. Okay. Listen to this. And it came to pass that while uh, Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came into Ephesus, or came to Ephesus, and finding there certain disciples. You got that? And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, Let's look unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Isn't that amazing? Paul says unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, What? Unto John's baptism. Now, wait a minute. Paul reminded them of something here, but I want to do something with that. Was it not John who preaching about the coming of Jesus. He was Jesus' forerunner. Was it not John the Baptist who was responsible for their baptism who said, there cometh one after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. The same shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire not many days hence. Okay. Wasn't that John that said that about Jesus? Well, Unto whose baptism were these fellows baptized? John. Now, this was, uh, I don't have it marked in my Bible, this particular Bible. This was probably around in the 50s AD, 50, maybe 56, 57, 58, somewhere AD. This was, um, we could say 30. Jesus crucified A.D. 29. This would have been close to 30 years after Jesus was crucified. So this would have been about 33 years after John had said, there comes one after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to lose. The same shall baptize you, the Holy Ghost and fire. What happened to the preaching? I want to tell you, what happened to the preaching is what happens in that game we play with people. John had a word from God. Are you with me? And maybe the direct followers of John and the ones right after them, because many of them went over and got into Jesus' ministry, they also had a word from God. But somewhere along the line, the word of God to John became a replaced word, and it became the word of John to men. And then after a bit, it wasn't even a word of John. It was a word of Fred to men. And in about 30 years in time, it wasn't a word from God to men. It wasn't a word from God to John. It wasn't a word from John to men. It wasn't even a word from men to men and men to men. It was word from men to men about a fifth generation. Are you with me? And what happens? We, I was talking to, uh, to a friend the other day, and, and Sharon and I talked about this. What happens every time you make a new recording? Or let's, let's say you have a, 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 particularly in the days when it was done on, uh, what's the word, uh, not digital, but 
analog. Analog recording on, on a cassette tape, okay, where you had to have that magnetic head touching the tape to pull it off, okay. What happens if you take the original tape that you bought from Kenneth Copeland back in 1975? What happens if you duplicate that tape to the second tape? But you begin to lose a little of the integrity. What happens if you take that copy and duplicate it? You lose some more. And what happens if you take that copy and duplicate it? You lose some more. And if you duplicate enough copies, all you'll end up with a tape is... That's, that's it. Paul said to these men, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, we haven't even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. It, I wonder what would have happened if Paul said, what are you preaching? I don't know how they would have written. Because that's what they were preaching. Am I making sense? You see, in order to for men of God to grow in the things of God, in order for a believer to grow in the things of God, they can't rely simply on a cassette. They can't rely simply upon what one man says, but they do need to do this. They do need to know for sure that the people that are speaking to them are chewing the cud and have a cloven hoof. They, they need to know that that person who is teaching has a mouth full of the Word of God because their heart is full of the Word of God, and they're not only talking it, but they're walking it. Because if you're not, you're hindering the anointing. What will the anointing teach you? What, what, what all things? Let's say you're. Let's say that, that I'm talking about the anointing of a minister of helps. What is that particular anointing going to teach the man that has received it? How to fun? That's it. How to function? But what food? What energy source does that anointing use to teach that man? The Word of God. So if you are anointed to be a minister of helps, but all you're getting is what has the anointing got to use in your life? Noise. Noise. You can call it pink noise, white noise, call it whatever you noise you want to call it. It's noise. All right? Again, I, I, I beg you not to become angry because I go to these places. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, here he is. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as what? Sounding brass or a noise. Tongue of men and angels. You can do this what you want to. As for me, Joshua wrote, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Allow me to paraphrase on that. As for me, I'm tired of hearing noise. Let me put it another way. As for me, I'm, hired, I'm tired of hearing the tongue of men and angels. I want to hear the tongue of God. When you pray in the Spirit, when you give an utterance in tongues, when you worship in the Spirit, from where did that tongue come? Angels, men, or God? Came from God. But you, beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Let me put it based the phrases I just used. 
If you are praying in the Spirit, worshiping in the Spirit, if you are giving an utterance in tongues, one of the gifts of the Spirit, and you're doing that in tongues, what, what tongue are you manifesting? The tongue of God, not the tongue of men. That's why men don't teach others how to speak in tongues. If you've got a man trying to teach you how to speak in tongues, get away from that garbage. Okay? Doesn't happen. When you worship in tongues, when you pray in tongues, when you are exercised by the Spirit in the gift of diverse kinds of tongues, the tongue that is coming out of your mouth is the, the words, the sound, is the tongue of God. Does that make sense? The tongue of men and angels do not build you up on your most holy faith. It is the tongue of God. And when you are built up on your most holy faith and you step into the pulpit, oh, God, help us to realize that if we want to speak for God, we need to be speaking with the tongue of God and not the tongue of men. Wow. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I am become what? Sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So let's stop here for just a second. What does that word charity, do you know what the Greek word is? Love. But do you know the Greek word? Agape. It is the God kind of love. Now, define for me from the scriptures. Define agape. What is agape? This is the love of God. But Frank, would you take if you take would you look on your phone and see what the Greek word for love is in 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 uh, in First John five three and Strong's. First John. Just curious. It could be a different word. Oh, and that's in 1 John 5, 3. So according to 1 John 5, 3, the Bible, this is the agape love of God that you keep his commandments. You can't keep his commandments when the words that you hear commanding you are the words of men and not of God. Because you don't know what you're doing. A man can tell you the right thing to do in a man's voice with little or no anointing. But if he's not walking in the love of God, he's a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal. If he's not himself keeping the word, then he's not walking in the love of God. Wow. This, I know this, this is some stuff that we perhaps we don't give a lot of consideration to. But I, again, I'm tired of hearing the voice of men. I'm, I'm tired of hearing the third and fourth generation of the voice of men. Prophet so-and-so stands up and says, yada, yada. And then prophet what's-his-name stands up and says, yada, yada. And then prophet who's it stands up and says, yada, yada, yada. And then Prophet Who's It Jr. stands up, yada, yada, yada. And Prophet What's His Name, the third, stands up, yada, 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 yada. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly, and I'm not trying to be humorous with this, but what's going on there? The, what may have been, may have been the voice of God with yada, yada, became very soon the voice of men. And when it became the voice of men, it began to be added to taken away from, 
changed a little bit, modified a little bit, so that no longer is it the voice of God, it is the voice of man. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, not the word of men. John 3.34. And Brother Frank, I'll ask you one more time because I know you got this on your Bible. Find the Amplified Bible, John 3.34. Big John, John 3.35. There you go. All right, now let's, let's let, 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 follow, follow along. You that are in your own home, watching by Facebook, follow this. For he whom God hath sent. Was Jesus sent? Yes. And he only said that and did that which pleased the Father. He was the Word made flesh. He could have spoken something crosswise with the Word, but he never did. He always did those things that perfectly pleased the Father, which means everything Jesus did was in faith, for without faith it is impossible to please God. For, for he whom God has sent speaketh the word of God. Now watch this. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Did you catch that? Jesus spoke only what God told him to say. Are you with me? How many men of God today and women of God today they're in the pulpit on Sunday. They may say something God said, but then they got a whole lot to say that hey, God had nothing to do with it. My, my. You see, there's the teaching of the Word, and that's, that's giving in understanding by revelation from the Spirit of God what the people need to learn about the gospel, about the Word of God. That's needful. That's the, that, that is, in fact, the Word of God coming forth. If it's coming by revelation, it is the Word of God coming forth. Whether it's coming in tongues with an interpretation or by a prophecy or by simply speaking a word that God gave. It doesn't have to be prophecy. Not everything God says is prophetic. Are, are we still on the same page? So we have the Word of God. But there's a lot of things that are coming forth that are not God's Word, all right? There's a lot of things that are coming forth that are contrary to the Word of God, but they're still in churches. And, and, and it, again, it brings about deception. Now, it says that the person who is speaking the Word of God, speaking only the Word of God, that God does not give them the Spirit by measure. Are you with me? And there are people who will tell you that Jesus had the full measure of the Holy Ghost. We don't. I believe this. We have the same measure of the Holy Ghost Jesus had, but not, of all, not all of us carry all the anointings that Jesus had. Jesus carried the anointing of the full fivefold ministry. He carried the anointing of every motive gift. He carried the anointing of all of those things at the maximum level, and that's why he was perfect, and he spent 30 years learning how to listen to that voice so that when he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, he came up out of the water, filled with the Spirit, and then he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. His mouth was fixed up absolutely full of nothing but the Word of God. Are we still on the same page? Gosh. Lord, help me. You are a joint heir with Christ. If you believe in Jesus, the work that he did, the same works you shall do and greater works than these shall you do because he went to the Father. What you are anointed to do, you are anointed at the, the same level that Jesus had. The question is, are you allowing yourself to be taught that? Or are we limiting that by our refusal to be taught 
or by what's being taught to us that's not biblically accurate in its context and content. How do I'm not losing somebody here? This, oh, God help us. I'm, again, I'm tired of just the words of men. I don't care how eloquent he is. I don't care how many years he spent in school. I don't care. And, and I'm not against that. I've, I've had my years in school. We need to be well spoken in the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be growing that constantly, continually. We need to be able to have a vocabulary substantial enough that we can talk to anywhere, anytime about the things of God and speak to them with truth that they understand. Are you with me? Jesus could talk to any man. He could talk to the scribes and the Pharisees. He could talk to the man who was blind and totally uneducated. Jesus could talk to the woman that, that was Jewish, that, that had been raised up and bought mitzvah at 12 and understood the scriptures and followed the teachings of the word of God. Jesus could talk to a Syrophoenician woman. Jesus could talk to a woman who loved him so much and, and, and would not do anything to defile what he said, or he could sit down with a, with a woman who had five husbands and wasn't even married to the man she's living with now at the well of Samaria. You and I need to be able to do the same thing. But if we're going to do that, we have to have our hearts full of the Word of God, and we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and the anointing that we have so that the Holy Spirit can take that anointing and teach us how to function in it at the highest possible level. I, I, don't, I don't think I can say that again. John 3.34, God gave Jesus the Spirit without measure because Jesus spoke only the Word of God. You have received the Holy Ghost. If you want to see the manifestation of Holy Ghost without measure, fill your heart with the Word of God so that nothing comes out your mouth that's contrary to the Word of God. Are you with me? Now, don't expect to operate in somebody else's anointing. But where you are anointed, you have the fullness of the Spirit. Understand that. But, but brother, uh, Frank, did you did you find that? Would you read that loudly for us? For since he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, proclaims God's own message. God does not give him his spirit spiritually or by measure, but boundless is the gift God makes of his spirit. And what he makes himself. It, 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 can I see that? This is this is so powerful. I want you to listen to this. Uh, there we go. There you go. For since he whom God has sent, let me ask you, man of God, has God sent you? Woman of God, has God sent you? Okay. If you're if you're a child of God, has God sent you? He sent you to somebody. For since he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, speaks what? The words of God. And listen to this, this is amplified, proclaims God's own message. He's not proclaiming what he heard Brother Billy Graham preach. Thank God for Billy Graham. He won more people to God than all of us combined. When, 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 when a man proclaims God's own message, you're not proclaiming what Ken Hagen preached. You're not proclaiming what Oral Roberts preached. Yeah, it might be the same message. It might have the same context. But you're not proclaiming what Oral Roberts preached. You're proclaiming what God said. Preach the word. God give us men that will step into the pulpit and be so bold as to announce, I'm telling you what God said. Hmm. Uh, it says, because the man proclaims God's words, God does not give him his spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless. Boundless. That means limitless, without boundaries. Wow. Is the gift God makes of his spirit. Boundless. I believe it's in Corinthians. Perhaps 1 Corinthians 9. Let me hand this back to you, my brother. Thank you, sir. 
read this to you. I love the Word of God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. And God is able. You believe God is able? What's God able to do? Especially anything he said, right? And God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Wow. Well, how are we going to get there? The Word. We cannot any longer allow ourselves, and this, this is a prophetic word. You do with it what you want to. We can no longer allow. We cannot one more minute afford to be a people who call ourselves Christians, but whose mouths are filled with the words of men. We must be a people whose mouths are filled with the word of the living God. 1 Corinthians, what was it, 2-5? Or was it 5-2? 2-5, wasn't it? Listen to the word of God, my brothers and sisters. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Let me begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of the speech or of the wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in much fear and in trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Do you hear that? He said, my words were not man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit and the power. You can't have a demonstration of the Spirit and power with man's words. If there is a manifestation of the Spirit of God in a service where you are, a true manifestation, it's because somebody heard what God said. And the person who was speaking was speaking what God said. And then he goes on to say this. I did not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power, that word power is dunamis, and that word is also spoken in Romans 16, Romans uh, 1.16, I am not ashamed of the power of God, for it, it, it for the, of the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ, for it is, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We've heard enough men. Let me, in, in the closing few minutes, let me, let me admonish you in some things. Pay close attention. Remember, I don't know who wrote the song. Who wrote the song, Sounds of Science? Simon Garfunkel, I think it might have been. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, just I remember. But one of the lines in that song says, people hearing without listening. Remember that? You that are my age will remember those words, and even younger. People hearing without listening. Let me encourage you, my brothers and sisters. The Bible says, take heed how you hear. Take heed what you hear. Well, you can't take heed to it unless you're listening to it. And if what you hear coming out of somebody's mouth is contrary to what you know to be in this book, get away from it. 
If you don't have the authority to shut it off, shut it up, or shut it down, leave the building. Amen. It's time that it is said of some believers, the believer has left the building. If you are reading a book by an author, I don't care what organization to, to, that, it, with, that he's connected. I don't care what education he has. I don't care what organization he has been sent by. I don't care what church in which he stands. It makes no difference. If you hear somebody say something that is crosswise or, let me say, write something. If you read in that author's book and it is crosswise with the Word of God, I mean blatantly crosswise with the Word of God. You need to get rid of that book, and I don't mean in the yard sale. Don't dish your poison off to somebody else. Fire pit is a really good place. Roast a hot dog with it. Roast some marshmallows. Make yourself some s'mores. You'd be better off eating s'mores than you are filling your heart and your mind with, with words that are contrary to the Word of God. Please don't get upset at me with this next one. If you are singing a song that is contrary to the Word of God, I beg you in the name of Jesus, quit singing it. I don't care how pretty your voice is. I don't care how many layers of instrumentation you have on that. I don't care how glamorous it sounds. I don't care what type of harmonies you have. You can have the fight. You can have full octavo harmony. That's eight part harmony. That's bass, baritone, second tenor, first tenor, second alto, first alto, second soprano, first soprano. You, I, if you've never heard something sung like you don't know what sound is. Oh, it is rich. It's it's enough just to make you sit down and kind of melt into your chair and listen to it. But if it's crosswise with the Word of God, it is a tinkling sound. God help us. Get away from it. Rewrite the words. There's a lot of there are a lot of doctrinal issues in the church today that have come out of song books, not out of the Word of God. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Has been developed into a doctrine that God gives and God takes away. And people do that because of their ignorance of the word of God and because they do not know the truth of what God has said in his word. Yes, Job said that because he was lied to unknowingly by his servant. God didn't take a thing Job had away from him. That God not only gave it to him, gave everything he had, but in the end, God gave him back twice what he had to start with. God's not the giver. I'm not the taker. He's not the stealer. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God help us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone watching. I pray for the people here tonight. I pray for the people who will view this in the days to come, who will hear these words. Lord, I'm not trying to be mean or hard towards anybody. But after the price that Jesus paid on the cross, how can I dare say anything less than what his word says? How can I do less as a watchman on the wall than to warn of the enemy that is approaching? How can I do less as a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim the message that God has sent? How can I do less as an ambassador of the king to speak those things with which I know the great king 
is pleased. For that, he will back up. How can I, as a worshiper, who must worship the Father in spirit and truth, have anything less than the accuracy of God's word come from my lips? How can I, as a praiser, when the scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, how can I offer to God that which is acceptable when it is not in line with what his word declares? My God, help us. Help me. Lord, start right here on this stool. And if there are words that come from my lips that are contrary to your words, show me. Teach me. Holy Ghost, remind me. May the words of my mouth be the words that God has spoken. It may not be in Hebrew or Greek. It may not be in French or Spanish or Swahili or Chui or Bimba. It may not be with an Irish or Scottish brogue. It may not be with a Slavic sound or Germanic. It may be just Tar Heel English. But I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to govern my tongue that what comes out of my mouth is pleasing to you. Do that for me, sir. Do it for those who are watching. Do it for those in this room who desire to have that boundless manifestation of Holy Ghost in their lives. Do it for each one of us, Father, who desires to be known as the voice of God and not merely an echo of men. Oh, Rebesti Brongle Karastokita. Oh, God, we hear enough echoes. Give us a new voice. We've heard too many echoes already. Lord, give us a new tongue. Thank you, Lord. Teach us your word by your spirit. Teach us how to minister by your anointing. We yield ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. We yield ourselves to you, great Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, help us. We desire to please you. We desire to walk in that manifest place of power and anointing in which people who hear the voice of God coming from our lips will recognize that it is indeed the voice of Holy Ghost, that it is indeed the voice of the Lord Jesus, that it is indeed the voice of the Spirit, the God, the Rock of Ages, that it is indeed that which is pleasing to a holy God, that it is indeed that which is the power of of God. It is indeed that which shall not go away, which cannot be overturned, which cannot be defeated, which shall produce what you said it will produce. Do that for us, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the matchless name of Jesus. If you're here tonight or you're watching and you want to enter into that which I've just prayed, just submit yourself to the Lord. Do what His Word says. Draw nigh to Him. He will draw nigh to you. Resist the devil then, and he will flee from you. 
For the further he flees from you and the closer you draw to God and he to you, the more accurate, the purer, and more powerful will be the words of your mouth. Death and life will indeed be seen in your tongue. Blessing will proceed from your lips and not cursing. For such ought not be the case that blessing and cursing both come from the same stream. Submit yourself. Lord, as Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. And you put that coal of fire on his tongue. You purged him. Purge us. Let us walk in this earth as a Samuel in which the word says, you did let none of his words fall to the ground. Do that for us, Father, in the name of Jesus. And in that name, that name that is above every name, the name at the which every knee should bow, beings in heaven and earth and under the earth, the matchless name of Jesus. We receive it, and in that name we say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I trust you receive from God's word tonight. Amen. Again, you there watching by Facebook, you can pick this up again on YouTube, or pick it up again on Facebook, watch it. Allow it to minister to you. We love you. We appreciate you watching. And if you can, come and join us here if you're in the Winston-Salem area, 525 North Peace Haven Road, Winston-Salem. Once again, God bless you. We'll see you next trip around.